I've known this man, I think since I moved to Los Angeles, I think 25 years ago, uh, at least I've known of him. And then I met him. I mean, he, he is the one man, the one producer to go to, to produce your shows. If you're going to do a, a, a cabaret, a concert, a one person show, I always heard the name Clifford Bell. Um, and as a 30 year veteran, of the Los Angeles nightclub scene. He is a singer, he is a producer. Mr. Clifford Bell. Woo -hoo. Woo -hoo. <laughs> hey, David. Hey, Clifford, how are you? I'm enjoying your long hair. Oh, thank you. Ah! It's nice. <laughs> it's quarantine COVID hair. <laughs> but, I am getting my shot this month, my first one. So after I get my second one, um, I'm gonna snip. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Uh, and how have you been doing? Do you remember where we met, where we actually met met? I, I remember it like it was yesterday. Was, wasn't that in, um, wasn't that at the, uh, oh, my, my 50s. We met at Michael Orland's house. We met at Michael Lorland's house in his living room in North Hollywood. And now I believe you were with Steven Brimberg. Does that make sense? Or were you friends with yes, Steven Brimberg? Yes, I remember that. Were you, do, were you doing Steven's show? No, I was with Michael. I, yeah, I used to work with Michael all the time. Oh, got it. And okay. we, I just happened to be there working on something and you guys came by. And I had heard of both of you, so we met and all these many years later we're still friends there you have it you know and i heard of course had heard about you from um i mean the first within the first year i got to la i went to um somebody said you have to go to karen morrow's class so i went to karen morrow uh or actually no the before i got to karen morrow i went to the um uh, the synagogue and when I was there, I heard several names. Karen Marr, you have to go to her class. And the other name I heard was Clifford Bell. In fact, that was probably your night you were organizing. Perhaps. One never knows. But then we officially met at my, I love that. These memories just pop back into my, uh, my head. Now, what is this, um, Lawrence? You're uh, Lawrence of? Lawrence of Cabarabia. Many, many, many years ago, somebody said to me, yeah. why, you're just a regular Lawrence of Cavaravia. And I thought it was so funny. It just sort of stuck. And um, so I call my business endeavors, I call it Cavaravia. Wow. I love that. I love that. So what was the first club that you, you started at? I mean, I know you've worked at, at all of them, the Cine Grill at the Hollywood Roosevelt Hotel, the M Bar, the Catalina Jazz Club. Oh yeah, I mean, I, I and even before that, I've been doing clubs for years and years. I've been, I did, I, I went to college in San Diego and did clubs in the nightclub world down in San Diego back a hundred years ago. And uh, you know, I guess the first place I ever played in Los Angeles was the Backlot, Studio oh One Backlot, which at the time was a very very big deal. At the time, that was like the most prestigious club in the city. And they had a very, um, they had a very popular open mic that was put together by Phyllis Teitler, uh, who is Jane Oliver's sister, as I imagine you probably know. Well, yeah. And, um, and you know, that, that open mic, it was, it was audition only. It was very hard to get into. It wasn't like just a free for all where everybody got up. You had to audition and be invited to do it, but it was Roseanne. Rosie O'Donnell, uh, Brian Lane Green, Sam Harris. I mean, it was like people like that, all pre-fame doing, mm -hmm. uh, doing open mic. And um, I was one of them. Oh, how fun that is. Yeah. And now, and of course, now they're coming out with a documentary about it. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, Mark Saltarelli is uh, 
being is the documentarian, our, our mutual friend. Oh, yeah. And um, it's produced by Lloyd Coleman, Gary Steinberg, who were two of the original producers at the back lot. And um, Chris Isaacson, who's one of the major forces in the nightclub world nowadays. And um, pretty much the four of them put together an event that was called Back to the Back Lot and filmed it. And then now a documentary is being shaped around both the live event and then the history of. And it's fascinating because it talks about, you know, first of all, the paradise that it once was in the mid 70s where it was, you know, party central. And then the as the page turned and it became the the world of AIDS and how life changed over that decade or so. It's really wonderful. I've seen most it's it's about 90% finished and um, and Mark shows it me cuts every now and again and it's so moving. You just cry your eyes out through it. Okay, guys, used to be paradise. Wow. It was an explosion, a complete immersion. I never thought there would be a place for me to be myself. Studio! Ah, nice! Anybody who tells you that they were there in the 70s and remembers it wasn't there. People were doing poke on the dance floor. They had little bottles. They just... First it was fun, then it was fun with problems, and then it was just problems. Most of the guys were shirtless. When you crossed over into the threshold of the dance floor was a kind of alternative reality. It was really my entrance into life. I was wide-eyed. It was Hollywood. Studio One was always about the back lot. It was the major place to be. Well, it was gay and straight audience, so a lot of them came in and said, oh, let's just go and have a dance in the disco. The show that we've been doing in New York, we did it here at the back lot. Something's going to happen when you played here. Alan Carp was in the back lot all the time. Lucille Ball, Tab Hunter, Robert Wagner, Natalie Wood. They're talking about demolishing the whole thing. All these years. As soon as it went public, we started to hear from folks. What do you mean you're tearing it down? They're going to destroy the building. It's going to be history. They won't be around anymore. In the 70s, we were behind closed doors, no windows, dark alleys, a secret society. I'm ready for a bottle to come at us any second now. And that doesn't happen anymore. Star Search would call us up and say, could you try putting this person in your show tonight? And this big dream was all just starting to fizzle. There are three things that change everything. Plague, famine, or war. We were experiencing plague. He used to always say to me, don't tell me there's not a war. The government wasn't going to do anything about it. Those of us who were in show business said, we can put on a show. She stepped in and organized this first benefit, and people were afraid to come. People in the business saying, don't do it, it's career suicide. It was fear. Our family received threats. They made the decision to bring me with them. If something's going to happen, the place is going to get blown up, at least we're all there together. We were running from hospital to funeral to hospital. I see that my drug use was in direct line with people dying and getting sick. I see all of these people that I used to dance with at the clubs who are now deceased. What, this is 30 years later and I still get very emotional about it. This night had to happen. You cannot overstate the historical impact of this building. If these walls could talk. West Hollywood lost 10,000 people and their spirits are still here because this was the place where they were happiest. God bless Studio One forever. Love dog. As 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 I get more mature in in age, my favorite films are now documentaries. Um, yeah, I watched that um, Jane Fonda in Five Acts last night. Have you seen that? No, that's oh, it's fun. so great. It's so great. I mean, what a life, Jesus. Yeah, right. Yeah. Especially after her getting the Golden Globe, that's a perfect thing to uh, yeah to to watch. So do you like directing or producing better? And for those who, who are watching, especially the Performing Arts Studio West, what is the difference in cabaret and concerts and nightclubs of, between directing and producing? 
Well, I think if I if I uh, could only do one, I think my favorite thing is to be a director, because essentially you are responsible for the um, vision. You know, it's your vision. Uh, at, at, because of how reality works, I pretty much have become a producer because being a producer is the only way that you can really control that you get your vision. You know, you have to in some way be responsible for or uh, able to get the, um, the money together and all that stuff to do things the way you want to do them. Yeah. So um, mostly I produce the, everything I direct. Occasionally I'm hired uh, just, you know, as just a director. Occasionally I'm hired as just a producer, but um, I like to do both together because it gives me more freedom to, mm -hmm. to actually do it what I want the way I want. Mm. Well, as you, as you know, you know, you, when you put shows together, you want to, you want to make it be how you want it to be, you know? Exactly. Exactly. And, but here's the thing with me and I'm sure it's with you sometimes too, because I, I don't, I don't think, especially when we were out of quarantine, you ever stopped. You were constantly working. And, yes. And I, I remember I, I, I haven't produced that many shows and benefits. I think maybe three in my whole lifetime where you probably, I, I don't know if you could count how many, hundreds. You're right. Um, yeah, I, I, um, I am prolific. If nothing else, I am prolific. It's, uh, I mean, it's amazing. And I, I just remember, you know, the last show that I did on 2019 was the, 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 the benefit for the Meet the Biz program, performing, uh, you know, for Performing Arts Studio West and at the uh, Catalina. And I mentioned it to you and you said, well, do you need help? And I went, oh, help. I can work with people <laughs> because I get so wrapped up in right. trying to do everything myself. And I said, collaboration which is so important well it really does it does take a team you know particularly on those days where you know you have 20 people coming in to each take their moment in the sun you know there's a lot of little things that need to be handled and one person's attention can't function all you know you need to be able to delegate somebody to be watching this and somebody to be watching that and you you had put together such a such a wonderful program. Your performers were amazing. You had such a high level of talent. The, uh, you know, just uh, amazing singers and and uh, your your performers with disabilities were all unbelievable as well. And uh, so I kind of played traffic cop for you and uh, kept the thing running. I, you know, I I would have lost my butt, <laughs> which <laughs> uh, you you saved my so-called ass um it's I'm it's not... harder than it looks <laughs> it's what it's harder than it looks to oh, put those kind of God. shows together yeah it's i it's it's really it was uh, thank you thank you for that evening because you you did save i mean more than save me you made everything polished you know? yeah. yeah yeah it was a really really special night it was really great um, I'm going to throw out a name. There's a okay. few I, I said, God, I want to just throw out the name to him. And sometimes they do it, but this time I think I have two or three. Katie Seagal. Yes, I love Katie Seagal. So proud of her with her new TV series. Right. And you work with her. You produce her shows. Yeah, Katie, you know, Katie, as I'm sure many people know, is a, is a phenomenal singer. I mean, she's just one of the best singers ever. She has the most beautiful voice. And in fact, she began her career as like uh, a very, very prestigious backup singer. She was, you know, singing back at ground for like Etta James and Kiss and uh, Bette Midler and Tanya Tucker. And, uh, you know, before she hit it as uh, Peg Bundy, she was a very, very sought after musician. And um, I, I, I've known, I've actually known Katie for a long time. I met her about 30 years ago, probably in passing, but uh, about maybe 10 years ago now, a friend of ours suggested me to help Katie produce her band. She wanted to start performing with her band again. This was, was a period of time where it was after 
the John Ritter show was over. John Ritter had passed, which was very sad. And I, uh, oh, I guess Katie had done Lost maybe, you know, she's always very active on TV, but um, she hadn't been doing much music since she wanted to put, she wanted to put her band back together. So with Katie, we started at Catalina's, but then she thought that was too fancy for her because she's really a rock and roll girl. She was like, I can't play someplace where they have linens on the table. <laughs> so we went looking around and we, um, we started to play M Bar, which was a really cool little club in Hollywood. And she loved M Bar and we, we did M Bar for, I don't know, we probably did it for two or three years every once in a while and always sold out. And, and then we went on tour a couple of times. We played a few different cities. Uh, it was very, I absolutely loved her. She's the sweetest, greatest lady ever. Uh, well, I look forward to after we get, all get out of quarantine for her next show. I bet it's, yeah. you know. And she's got this new TV series coming on called Rebel. And she I looks saw... like a gazillion bucks in it. My God, she looks so I mean, what, and the co-stars and everything, it looks like right. you want to watch. Yeah. Now, beside doing shows, you produce CDs. What, what Lee Lessig's and uh, I, I produce what? CDs. What did you just say? Uh, CDs. Uh, oh, I do produce CDs. Yeah, I've produced a lot of CDs. For, like Lee, Lee Lessig. I was I was a, a you know like project coordinator or something like that. I actually the actual producing credit was Michael Orland, oh. but I was you know I was a third of the team at the yeah. time, Lee and Michael and uh, his first album. Got it. Yeah, yeah. beautiful gorgeous. album. Gorgeous album. Beautiful, beautiful singer. And Eileen Barnett, did you? I did, on? I produced Eileen Barnett's live album. And uh, you know, that's, it's a live album of her nightclub act. And to this day, it's one of my favorite nightclub acts I've ever done. She, I, I actually was listening to the record just the other night and it's such a good act. It's so well put together. And um, uh, John Boswell was the musical director and he plays so beautifully. So the arrangements were all amazing. And uh, it was autobiographical around her career. And she had a very, you know, she's had an interesting story and uh, it's very good. If, you ever, if anybody ever sees it, Eileen Barnett live from the Cinegirl, try to get it. It's very good. Uh, if you're a cabaret lover. Of course, of course. And you, you know, I was reading the list of all the people you have worked with, Billy Barnes, Jason Gray, Maureen McGovern, Mary Jo Monday, Brian Lane Green, you know, uh, Mickey Rooney? Mickey Rooney, yeah. I For a period of time, I used to run um, the Cinegrill when it was um, reopened, you know, they, they redesigned it. And oh, when they were downstairs. Downstairs, yeah, Michael Feinstein. And, um, for, and uh, to reopen it, we, the opening act was to be Mickey Rooney. And so I produced Mickey Rooney's show and um, he was so interesting because he never, he didn't want to ever talk about the past. You know, everybody of course wants to ask him about things. He goes, I never talk about the past. I only talk about the future. So he, he was a funny little guy. He was, he was very um, intense. Yeah. That's but um, but brilliant, you know, I mean, he was a real piece of history. I mean, he, he there was a period of time when he was the biggest star in the world. Right. You know, in his youth, he was literally the biggest box office star. Mickey in the world. and Judy. Mickey and Judy. And he, uh, we, we, got in, we got into a conversation about Judy Garland and he started crying. He said, Judy Garland was the most important person in my life. I, he says, I can't even think of her today still without crying. It was very moving to see how deep their relationship was. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing to, to have those, the experiences that we have as we go through life, you know, you, you, you shoot for what you want and then you have all this, you know, I, I just pictured following the yellow brick road. You don't know where it's going to go. Exactly. Um, one other person I wanted to throw out because I saw Bonnie Frank Franklin, you work with Bonnie? Yeah, you know, Bonnie Franklin was sort of the beginning of a new career for me. I, um, you know, I'd been around for a while and did, did a bunch of stuff, you know, but I was just sort of a person in the world trying to get along. And um, my friend, Lara Teeter, I don't know if you know who Lara Teeter is, but he's a, he's a Broadway guy of some note, renowned. 
he did about 10 Broadway shows. He did Seven Brides for Seven Brothers and Pirates of Penzance. And he was the star of the last George Abbott, big George Abbott musical, um, On Your Toes. And he was Tony nominated as the leading man of On Your Toes. And he was a New York person, but when he moved to LA, a bunch of people called him to put their nightclub acts together. And he called me and said, um, I don't really know anything about the nightclub medium. I don't know, really know anything about cabaret per se. And that's sort of your specialty. Will you help me? So we kind of became a little team. And the first thing we did was a review at uh, starring Bonnie Franklin and Gary Sandy and Terry Ralston. Oh, and a I, guy Terry, named, Terry was my teacher for one semester at San Francisco State. Yeah, yeah. And um, a guy named Byron Neese. Uh, he went as Bud Neese, but his professional name was Byron Neese. And it was an off-Broadway review. And it, uh, Bonnie's manager at the time, for her manager for a billion years, opened a little coffee house in Studio City called Tonto and Dietz. And it was a little venue, a little cabaret venue, and all they served was like coffees and desserts. But Bonnie and people like Bonnie, that ilk of uh, that level of performer, you know, celebrities, but with TV credits and stuff, would do their nightclub acts there. And uh, that's how I met Bonnie. Bonnie and I used to have lunch together all the time. She was such a sweet lady. I loved her. And that's actually how I met Eileen Barnett, because Eileen Barnett replaced Terry, because okay. Terry went off to do a, a gig, I think in Alaska or something like that. She was doing a season in Alaska right. of book shows, and Eileen took over for her um, in the in that musical review, and that's how I became friends with Eileen. I love it. I love how it's you know, you know, one person to the next to this. It's just how yeah. the, the business is. Yeah, you meet people. And anyway, you, that was the that was really the beginning for me of what became my career because Lara and I did we put together an act with um, Debbie Gravit, you know, formerly Debbie Shapiro Gravit, who won a Tony for Jerome Robbins Broadway, and Michael McGuire, who won a Tony for um, Les Mis Rob, and we put together a, a concert with them that ran for like twelve years. We um, we played all over the country and Michael Orland was the musical director of that. And, and that it was that year of doing things with Lara that, I mean, I still sort of, that's who I am now still, that's still the career I have. And that was 25, 30 years ago, probably. Do you have a favorite, I mean, it's, this is hard to say because you've done so many shows, but I wouldn't say a favorite moment because I know you have so many, but is there a moment that comes to your mind right now that you go, oh, I remember this time. Oh, I have a lot of those. <laughs> I bet. <laughs> I have a lot of those. Um, Debbie was always very meaningful to me. Debbie Shapiro Gravit, Debbie Gravit. She's such an amazing singer. And she was, I had always considered her kind of a big star before I really knew her very well. And I, I'll, I'll always remember, I, I, I'd known her in passing and I, I went to the opening night party of Jerome Robbins Broadway when it came here and she had just won the Tony. Yeah. And I said to her, you know, I was congratulating her on the Tony. And, and she said, how are you? I, I said, congratulations. And she said, how are you doing? And I said, well, I didn't just win a Tony. And she said, not yet. So I always thought that was a very generous thing of her to say. Um, but anyway, uh, so I didn't, she, I always admired her from afar. So to actually become the person who flew on planes with her and drove around and sat in hotel rooms and played backstage and stood in the wings when she went out, you know, that, that was always very meaningful to me. Yeah. And, you know, and I felt that way about Katie. I mean, there were times with Katie just because she's such an unbelievable singer. She's got such the most gorgeous voice. Yeah. But, um, you know, I, I have a lot of, magical moments oh, like that I bet. well and that's why we have to watch your radio show to hear more of those magical moments. yes my podcast i love that we both have our little podcasts it's fun you know i just you know i've been wanting to do something like this for a while and and the quarantine made me do it so yeah i'm up i'm, I'm almost gonna hit the 200th show oh my god well you're far more um <laughs> uh, ambitious than i 
I did it. I did it religiously when I started. I did it for like seven years, yeah. once a week, religiously. I never missed a week. Yeah. And then I kind of ran out of people I was enthusiastic to talk to. Yeah. And I probably about a year or so went by where I only did one or two people. And then with quarantine, I got ambitious again. And I, the studio that I had been doing it out of uh, closed its studio. Mm -hmm. So there was no physical space to go to anymore. So I got together with my friend, Andrew Apple, who, you know, Andrew, don't you? I don't yeah. know if you do or not, but he's sort of my go-to tech person, my co-producer. And he has a studio in his house where I film it now and, and I revamped it. I, you know, did a new opening sequence and he sort of is my co-producer. So I don't do it on Zoom. I, I go to his place and do it out of his studio. Although now because of COVID, yeah. we um, we do it Zoom. I like that. Yeah. Um, I have to bring this up because of course you, you do shows, you, I mean, like we talked about you, you uh, hundreds, but there's one, event that you do every year for, I don't know, how many years has it been now for the birthday party? Last year would have been 22, I think. 22, so celebrating Barbara. Barbara Streisand's birthday, yes. Why? You know, when, when you asked me what my special memories are, I, my first thought was I, basically a lot of them are centered around the Barbara party. Yeah. Um, but. 22, well, I guess this year will be 23 years ago, a bunch of friends, very creative, funny friends. Um, Susie Mosier, I mean, people know these people, Maxine Lapidus, Hillary Carlip, uh, Lee Lessig, um, John Boswell, a bunch of us, like maybe 10 of us got together just for our, our own amusement. Yeah. And we had a birthday party for Barbara Streisand in a living room and everybody picked a Barbara Streisand song and sang it in some different way than it's known to be done. And it was the, literally, it was the most fun I've ever had in my entire life to date. Yeah. And um, as time passed, I, I, I recognized what I had because it's like everybody, you can't find a person in the world that doesn't, that who's in show business, who doesn't want to sing a Barbara Streisand song. But in real show business, you sort of, you're steered away from singing Barbra Streisand songs. You know, right. you're not, you, nobody wants to hear you do the way we were. You know, it's like, leave it alone. Right. Uh, but one day a year, everybody gets to do their Barbra Streisand song. You've done several of them. You, you did Go to Sleep from oh, On a Clear Day one. with Justin Charles Cowden in oh, Jamas, hilarious. And um, you did Losing My Mind a year or two Which ago. Which I did. <laughs> and you lost your mind on stage. I found it though, it was right back yeah. there. But, you know, it's been, and, you know, the thing that's really amazing about it is in 22 years in a show that has, you know, usually about 20 to 25 performers, there have really only been a handful of songs that have been report, been repeated. I mean, Barbara has such an enormous catalog between the movies and the 60 albums and the, you know, everything that she's touched in her career. Uh, literally, there's only been literally a handful of songs that have been sung more than once over the years. And, and you know, people call me, people call me in September, the show is always in April, and April, her birthday is April 24th. And, um, and um, people call me in September and say, I want to sing this this year, you know, it's like, people get get started. And it was so heartbreaking, because last year, when, when the sh shutdown started, started in March and there was still sort of a, well, we'll see in a month, we'll see in a month and we'll see in a month. And I had the date of May 3rd was yeah. when it was supposed to be. And, you know, I, 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 for the last 20 something years I've done it for charity. And for the last seven or eight years I've done it specifically for Project Angel Food, which is a an organization that I'm very uh, committed to and involved with. And that's angelfood.org for anybody that wants to check it out. And um, so I called Angel Food and I was like, I just, I want to do it so bad. I don't care that they don't want us to. And, and they said, they, you know, they're, they're a legal organization that have, you know, they have to answer to government restrictions. 
And they said, you know, you just, you can't break the rules. You just, you absolutely can't do it. The board's not, nothing live. At that point, they were saying nothing live till the fall. And, right. you know, now here it is spring of next year. Although I'll tell you, I'll tell, uh, I'll make an announcement here on your podcast. I'm, I'll make news. <laughs> Although it's, I'm not, I can't, I'm not exactly sure what's going to happen yet, but I've been in, I've been in my mind thinking I'll do it. But I, you know, I really don't like music on Zoom. I, I don't think it's very successful. I don't think it really works. I mean, sure, Meryl Streep and Christine Baranski and Audra McDonald were hilarious and Ladies Who Lunch. Yeah. But 99.9% .9 of the time, I think singing on Zoom just really doesn't work. So um, I've been thinking I would go to Catalina because they're doing that some now and rent Catalina's and have a band and have everybody be far apart and have singers come and you know the few a few things have done that so i wouldn't be the first and you can't have an audience but you can film it and you can film it and you can film it a live performance and put it online a, a perfect idea. so yeah. so that was cooking in my brain and then i'm walking down the street the other day and i run into manny now i have known manny the guy who the manager i love of manny Catalina's. And um, I've, I've known Manny for 25 years probably, and I've never run into him on the street. <laughs> and I ran into Manny and I said, Manny, it's so crazy I run into you. I'm thinking about doing this. He goes, oh, absolutely, you have to. Call me, you know, call me Monday and we'll work it out. So I haven't committed, I'm not 100% sure, but there's a 90% chance that we're gonna do Barbara this year online live performances oh my god to raise money for to raise money for catalina uh, uh, for well, project it's, angel it's food. what you do with you what you do with this and, and project angel food it's just it's something that people look forward to every year so, yeah i mean it's a, it it had got i mean to the tickets were sold there were a bunch of tickets sold when i announced it in like march and uh you know p the tickets flew off the shelf um the one thing I do want to say, though, when you say what's one of your magical moments, uh, I had I had invited our our friend. I'm sure you, I'm sure you know him as well, Alan Rich, the songwriter, yeah, Alan, Alan Rich, yeah. who is a, also a phenomenal singer. And I had just run into him and I said, "Come do my barber party," because he had written a song Barbara recorded and come to sing that and blah blah blah. And one day, he cal he calls me right before it was time to do the barber show. And he says, are you sitting down? And I said, yes. And he said, well, Barbara has been hearing about the Barbara party and she loves the idea of it. And so she herself can't come this year because she's got a funeral she's going to that day. But she's gonna send Richard J. Alexander, who is her longtime co-director and Jay Landers, who is her longtime record producer. And so, Richard J. Alexander and um, Jay Landers came to the Barbara party and they brought a letter from Barbara that's Dear Clifford, blah, 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 love Barbara, so I can die. I have a letter that says <laughs> Dear Clifford, love Barbara. It's, it's like hanging on your walls. Okay. Yeah. And, um, and they stayed for the entire, you know, these shows are ridiculously long. I'm not going to do that again this year, but they're like, they're usually like three hours long. They stayed the entire time. They stayed after and talked to everybody. I mean, it was really an amazing thing. It was a magical and, evening. And, and, um, and uh, Richard said, Barbara would love this. He said, he said to me, he said, you get, you get, he said, I didn't, he said, I was afraid of what this could be. I was worried that it was gonna be stupid or insulting or, you know, not cool. And he said, but you really get her sensibility. I can see what you've done putting this show together. And he said, you get her. Yeah. And I said, yes, I do. Thank you for doing it. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. What a joy. Yeah. And and one of the Barbara parties you sang with the wonderful Kiki Epson. Yeah, well, that, that was not at the Barbara party. That was um, going to be last year's Barbara party. And we sang it at something else to get ready. Oh but um, I had a, I, um, I have a clip of it, so I don't know if you're able to show that. But if if and when we do the next Barbara party, that I hope I'm hoping to do that with Kiki because I love that so much, and she's so amazing. 
She's incredible. And what a sweetheart. I, I had an 11th hour inspiration and I sent Kiki a text and said, is this too gay for you? <laughs> and fortunately, she was an ally. So. Well, I love that the whole Judy Garland summer yes. stock um, story. Right. You actually called well, me. Oh, I will tell but, you. Yeah. I... I, I there was an opportunity that came up about a cool booking, and I called Kiki first thing in the morning one day and said, if you can go talk to these people to this afternoon, you know, we could, you could probably get this cool thing. And she said, well, I'd love to, but I'm at the tractor store. So <laughs> Kiki, for those of you who don't know, Kiki lives on a ranch with many horses. Right. So this and, morning we actually had to feed and clean 15 horses before I could be here. To so see she's like today. a ranch woman when she's not a glamorous chanteuse. Yeah. So anyway, so I said that's like Judy Garland in the movie Get in the movie uh, Summerstock because it starts with her in overalls dr riding a, tra a tractor, and that actually her, your part of this song is from that movie. That's Did you crazy. Know that? Yes, it's crazy. <laughs> so anyway, anyway, I'm officially gay today. This is this is like such a thrill to be able to do this with Kiki. Thank you. Oh my God. Thank Here you. we go. Forget your troubles, come on. I'm here again. You better in the chase all your things above our clear again. Say hallelujah. So let's Come sing a song of cheer again. Happy but days on the day judgment day. Here again. The sun is shining. All Come together. on, get happy. Shout it now. The Lord is waiting no to take one your hand. Who can doubt it now? Shout out, come on. So come let's on, tell the world about it now. Happy For days are here, here again. again. We're headed for the river, and now your cares will soon be gone. There'll be no more. From now on, from now on, now on get your troubles, come on. are here again. You better chase the all your blues of love away. The clear again. Come on, so sing out, come on. let's sing a song happy. of cheer again. Happy times. Happy Happy nights, happy nights, happy days are here. Again. Well, that was very happy making. Thank you, my dear. Sharing this day.